Today we're talking about symbolism in film. Uh, now, I don't know if you remember what symbolism is from your introduction to literature course, approaches to literature course. Symbolism, Shangzhen, is the idea that some things have more than simply the functional meaning. Uh, so in general, we can talk about universal symbols and personal symbols. A universal symbol is a connection between a thing and an idea that uh, many people will know and that applies to more than simply what you are currently watching. For example, a rose symbolizes love, romantic love. It's not because nature decided that the rose will be the romantic flower. This is a meaning that humans added onto this flower. And it doesn't matter in what kind of story or film a rose appears. Whenever one appears, uh, automatically we think that the idea of romantic love is somehow related to this scene or this moment. Um, another example would be something like uh, a, in a film, a shot of a door closing. And this symbolizes the end of something or the loss of something. Uh, again, it doesn't matter uh, what kind of story you see this in. If there is a shot focusing on emphasizing a closing door, uh, we can start to think about what is ending or what is being lost in this moment. So these are universal symbols. There are also personal symbols. For example, if in a story, a character uh, has a favorite book. Then the reason that this book is their favorite would tell us uh, what this book symbolizes. If this book is the character's favorite because uh, it is one of the few books that they have kept on reading since childhood, then uh, the book could be a symbol of childhood innocence. It could be a symbol of a better past, nostalgia, uh, if the book is the character's favorite because it was a gift from a family member or a good friend, then it could be a symbol of the character's relationship with that person. So in this example, if the book is uh, lost, like uh, it disappears and the character can't find it. It could be a symbol that their relationship with the person is changing. If the character decides to throw away the book, uh, it would symbolize that this character wants to end their relationship with the other person. But the meaning of that book would depend on the specific story and the specific character in that story. So this is a personal symbol. Uh, and then there are some symbols that are uh, in between, let's say. It is a, it's not just applying to one character or one situation, but not everybody will believe in the same symbol. For example, uh, if a Bible appears in a story, then for those viewers who are more religious or are more familiar with Christianity might find it meaningful to observe what the character does or says about that Bible or whether the film emphasizes that Bible or not. But for audience members who are not religious, who simply see the Bible as just another book, then it may only carry the meaning of being a classic or an old book, and it may not carry a more religious or spiritual meaning. 
in all of these cases, the symbolism, the meaning of the object that turns it into a symbol is more than just functional. Right, the what is the function of a rose? It is as a kind of gift. Uh, but the meaning of that gift depends on the symbolic meaning of the rose. What is the function of a closing door? Simply to make sure that the room or the house is safe. Uh, again, there the additional meaning is added um, by the emphasis of the film and the meaning that we viewers add on to that emphasis. And most especially, if you see a book in a movie, it could mean nothing uh, or it could mean something very important. Again, depending on how the film treats the book and how the character treats the book. These are all more than functional meanings. Um, now in film particularly, uh, for example, some of the films we have been watching uh, already have used symbolism. If you think about Constantine, the fact that he keeps on smoking every time he lights up a cigarette, that cigarette is a symbol of his cynicism or nihilism, the idea that he doesn't care whether he lives or dies. Uh, because of his past, because of all that he can see. Um, therefore, he doesn't really care about his own life, and that is symbolized by the cigarettes. Uh, or if you think about clouds of Sils Maria. Uh, the cloud formation, the Maloya snake. Uh, that everyone keeps talking about, uh, but they don't get to see until after Kristen Stewart's character Valentine disappears. And so that cloud formation becomes a symbol of uh, maturity on the part of um, Maria Enders, the character played by Juliette Binoche. Throughout the movie, she's struggling to understand this older character, uh, she's struggling with the decision whether to continue to play the older character. And Valentin has been trying to help her with this process. Um, but we notice that only after Valentin disappears and Maria sees the Maloya snake cloud formation. After that, she comes to terms with uh, the fact that her character is now the older character, not the younger character. Um, moreover, in that film, everyone keeps talking about it as if it's something that they want or the something that they expect. It's an object of uh, non sexual desire. Uh, and so when it is finally fulfilled, uh, there's the idea that you should be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. So when they finally when when Maria finally sees this cloud formation, she achieves maturity, but she loses her assistant uh, and the person who is most supportive of her. We notice that later on she has a new assistant, uh, but this new assistant is more formal. There's less of a personal connection. Maria keeps her at arm's length, doesn't let her get too close. Uh, so the idea of the assistant providing emotional support has ended because uh, Maria already has achieved what she set out to achieve, what she wanted to achieve, and that is all symbolized by that cloud formation. Uh, so we've already been uh, seeing symbols in the films that we've been watching. Um, but one of the uh, genre of films that most uh, profits from the use of symbolism is horror films. Uh, we talked about horror uh, two weeks ago. We mentioned that horror films are about something uh, weird or strange in the story that usually repels people, disgusts people, makes us uh, afraid of the unknown wants to uh, makes us want to stay away. 
And if horror is based on the idea of the unknown, then whatever that unknown thing is, the functional meaning is not clearly defined. For example, if you see a monster in a horror movie, you don't know what the monster can do. You don't know what the monster wants to do. Or you don't know if they're uh, kind or evil, if they want to hurt you or help you. So the functional meaning is left undefined. But the symbolic meaning uh, usually is clearer. So for example, in the horror film Get Out, Tao Chu I'm sure most of you know by now that this movie is about racism. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil the ending for you. At the end of the film, it's revealed that these white people are not just racist white people. They're actually evil white monsters who steal black people's bodies uh, so that they can continue to live uh, and gain the so-called um, stronger or faster black body abilities for themselves. So in this movie, uh, because we are so uh, prepared for the idea of racism in this world, um, we don't have to think too hard about why these white characters want to steal black bodies. Without that, uh, additional layer of meaning without that racism, there could be many different reasons why somebody would want to steal another person's body. That functional meaning does not have to be uh, defined very cl clearly, but because there is a layer of symbolism, we are very clear about uh, what this film is trying to say with these monstrous actions. Um, or for example, uh, in Personal Shopper, which is also technically a horror movie. Uh, when near the end of the film, when Kristen Stewart's character is sitting in the garden and behind her a uh, cup floats through the air and falls to the ground and shatters. Uh, the action of a ghost. That specific action doesn't have a functional meaning aside from letting us and the character know that there is a ghost. The meaning of that action is defined by the symbolism of the film, which is that um, the character is, want, pays attention to ghosts, looks for ghosts because she wants a sign from her dead twin brother. So in that film, the undefined idea of ghosts is defined by symbolism as connected to grief, idol, and loss and trauma, these ideas. So uh, when we see the ghost in the background, we get the feel, we, not her, because she doesn't see the ghost, but if you remember, we see the person of the ghost in the first half of that specific shot. So we audience members, uh, we get a feeling of confirmation. We get a feeling of relief because we know that uh, Kristen Stewart's character is not waiting in vain. She's not wasting her time. Uh, her brother really is trying to communicate with her. But all of this is on the symbolic level. Simply, if we showed that image, that specific shot to somebody who knew nothing about the film, they would not understand what it was talking about. And that's how you can tell that it is a symbolic image and not a functional one. Um, because symbolism works so well in horror movies, or we could even say they're so essential, to horror films. Uh, recently, there has been a growing number of horror movies who uh, that like Get Out sort of heavily 
define the meaning of their movie through the symbolism. So in the past, uh, you would have horror movies that simply like to scare you. Um, and they would also have symbolic meanings, but even if you didn't understand the symbolism, you could still enjoy simply the experience of watching that film. Um, but more and more horror films uh, want to clarify their symbolic meaning and uh, by doing so, it turns these films into so-called message films, films that primarily try to tell you some kind of message. Get Out is about racism. Another horror film called It Follows is about sexual history and disease. Um, another horror film called The Babadook is about the uh, terrors of childhood and, and growing up. All of these meanings are incredibly clear because the filmmakers depend heavily on the symbolic meaning. Uh, whereas in the past, you would have movies like uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the old one. There's recently been a remake, uh, but the original one. Yes, there is symbolism um, regarding like not to trust strangers or like um, uh the the distortions of grief and loss but really most people just went to see the movie to see a guy holding a chainsaw killing people um that's not to say that older horror films never talked about specific messages um but it has become more and more a recent trend so that in fact there are many horror movies today that are so focused on their message that they're not really scary anymore, that it doesn't even feel like horror. It simply feels like somebody teaching you a lesson. Uh, so as you can see, symbolism can sometimes go too far. But even in the most non-horror, ordinary, or even blockbuster film, there will always be symbolism. Symbolism is an essential part of telling stories and making meaning from those stories. Okay, do you have questions about symbolism? Okay, um, the other half of today's lecture is Today we're going to watch a period piece, which you might know better as a historical drama. It's called a period piece because it's a piece of film. It's a piece of storytelling that is set in a specific historical period. So it's a period piece. Uh, so immediately from this name, we know that you can't just wave your hands and say it's set in the past. You can't just say it's set in the 17th century. The best period pieces don't just pick the century. They also pick the decade or even the specific year. And it's possible to do this because history changes every day. Things change every day. Uh, and depending on how much you care about uh, the specific details of your story, uh, sometimes you will need to be very specific about the exact time that your story takes place. So this brings us to the main question of a period piece, which is why is it set in the past? Why is it set in a particular year or a particular period? For every other genre of film, whether it's set in the present day or set in the future, like in science fiction, or set in a fantasy world, like in fantasy, uh, there, the, the background, the production design, the setting is all there to help you tell the story. 
especially for things like science fiction and fantasy. Every detail that you design is supposed to help you tell the story. So why or how would a story be helped by setting it in the past? Usually it is because that story would not work in the present day, whether because it depends on technological limitations or it depends on a specific zeitgeist, 时代精神, or it depends on some kind of political situation uh, or different uh, morals in society, different ways of treating men and women, treating minorities, uh, treating people from different classes that simply would not be acceptable today. All of these are possible reasons why you might want to set a story in a specific time period. But going by these reasons, depending on your specific reasons, you have to carefully choose exactly when uh, your story takes place. Now, when we talk about period pieces, there's always this debate. They say that the past is a foreign country. So when you make a period piece, should you try to make it as realistic as possible and emphasize the differences between people then and people now? Or should you try to make it as relatable as possible and uh, convey the idea that people are people no matter when they lived and that their problems are all similar and we can always understand them? The correct answer is obviously both, right? On the one hand, the story elements, you should try to make them as understandable and relatable as possible, but the story details and the plot elements, you should try to change to emphasize the difference in historical time period. But the balance between the two is never ideal. Different people will disagree about where to set the balance. For example, a few years ago, there was a new adaptation of Little Women. Uh, the novel is called Xiao Fu Nu, but this and so was an earlier adaptation. But the fir, this newer adaptation in Chinese is simply called Taman. Uh, I think it's because um, it the that title is similar to a title used by the director for her earlier film, and so it's kind of like a marketing thing. Um, but what I want to talk about is the difference between those two um, adaptations, how they treat the past. Um, and the earlier adaptation focused more on the elements from the past, not just the characters and the clothing and the plot, but also uh, the style of filmmaking. The camera didn't move very much. Yeah, the images emphasized the buildings and the environment and the neighborhood. Whereas the newer adaptation tried to feel more relatable. So the characters were still wearing older clothing. They were still living in older houses, but they moved with more energy. The images were brighter and more energetic and colorful. Their clothing was also less well defined, even though we could tell it's not modern clothing. Uh, and the the relationships, the the style of acting and dialogue also felt more like people would talk today and less like a uh, dialogue that comes from a history book or a novel. And so uh, when the new adaptation came out, people were debating whether this is a good idea. Uh, and some people mentioned that uh, we should be careful about the idea of historical difference because 
we don't know anybody from so called history. All that we have are from history books, old newspapers, uh, old novels, things like that. And all of these are not direct records. They have been designed and modified uh, by the writer. Uh, and we therefore are not getting a true picture of the past. We're getting a so-called mediated picture of the past. Other people uh, said that we have to remember that people do change, situations do change, that when we do have a direct record of the past, usually people in the past behaved quite differently. Uh, so even if the older adaptation was not uh, faithful to how people talked and behaved in the past, at least there was still a noticeable difference from the present, and that in itself uh, had value. This is an open debate, so we can uh, think about this idea. How relatable are these characters? How different are they? whenever we watch a period piece. The current trend is to make people more relatable. Um, and uh, not quite sure if that is always a good idea. Sometimes you want to make a movie to emphasize the differences. Um, and but no matter which side you emphasize, a period of peace is not supposed to be a fantasy. It's supposed to be somehow defined or limited by the historical period that you choose. Even if the story is fiction, the sense of that period should still come through. OK, so do you have questions about period pieces? OK, this week we're watching a movie called The Witch by Robert Eggers. Eggers is a very special filmmaker. He only makes period pieces, and whenever he makes period pieces, he obsessively defines every specific detail to make sure that it is as accurate to that period as possible. Uh, up to now, he has made three films. The Witch is his first film. Uh, later on, he made um, a film called The Lighthouse, starring Robert Pattinson, whom you might remember from Twilight. Uh, and recently, and like just a few weeks ago, he released a new film called The Northman, or Beoren, uh, which is a Viking story. So he only makes films that are very different from the present day, and he focuses very hard and in very much detail on those differences. So for example, this week's film, The Witch, is set in the 1630s in North America. This is, of course, before the English colonies became the United States. Uh, and it's set in a community that is religious, they're Puritans, Qing Jiao Tu. So they wear the clothing of that time. They live in houses and locations of that period. But because Eggers is so focused on these details, he even makes the dialogue accurate to that period. He did research into how people talked back then, and he wrote his script using that kind of language. Uh, the houses that the characters live in, the actors actually lived in those houses when they weren't shooting the film to give them a feeling of authenticity, historical authenticity. 
so like even when he was shooting the film, he tried to reduce modernity as much as possible. The clothing. Uh, the costumes were made. Using the skills and the materials only that they had back in the 1630s. No modern sewing, no machinery, uh, no modern fabric. Sometimes the the focus on details uh, can be too much. For example, in the Norseman, uh, there are very brief shots of boats in this on the sea in the background. They're out of focus. You can barely see the boats and they're on screen for like less than 10 seconds. But even for those boats, Eggers asked his production team to build boats in a historically accurate way. Uh, when like he realized, for example, that one of his characters helmets was not from that exact time period or not from that exact Viking culture. He asked his production team to remake the helmet, remake the costume. So when we talk about uh, period pieces, Robert Eggers definitely falls on the side of historical difference. And whether there is any relatability uh, in the characters or in the story depends on how we, the audience, understand the film. Eggers makes no effort uh, to try to make the story relate to us or connect with us. But of course, it can't be entirely alien. Otherwise, nobody would give him the money to make the movie. So it is possible to understand what is going on. And that's part of the fun of uh, art, right? To get to connect and relate to people who are so different from us, to see the commonality in these differences, to realize that we really are one human race. Um, now, part of the historical accuracy of the witch is that in those days, Puritans really did believe in things like God and the devil and good and evil and witches and black magic. Today, when you talk to somebody about these ideas, so most of the time they will say, oh, that's probably just a symbol for something, something, something. But back in those days, Puritans really believed that these things actually existed in real life. And so when we watch this film that's set in that time period following these characters, uh, we can't help thinking whether in the story of this film, these usually symbolic supernatural elements really do exist. Now, I said that in many horror films, the functional meaning of a symbol is left undefined, but it doesn't have to be. A symbol can be functionally, functionally well-defined and carry symbolic meaning. So just because these characters really believe in like God and the devil and witches doesn't mean they're not symbols. They, the characters can believe in these things and they can be symbols. Uh, and that's also part of the richness of this film. There's more than the standard way to interpret this film. There are many, many meanings here, and they are many of them are produced simply because Eggers does not try to define those ideas very clearly. They still fit together, they still make sense, but we, the audience, get to define many of these meanings for ourselves. One last thing I want to note. OK, two things. First, this is the debut film of Anya Taylor-Joy, who is recently a very popular actress. Uh, this is her first feature film role. The other thing I want to note is that. Even though this is not the horror week, this is the period piece week. The Witch is the scariest movie we're going to watch this semester. 
Uh, and a lot of that fear comes from the score, the music. So if you get scared easily, I recommend that you turn the volume down just a little bit. OK, do you have questions about this film? OK, before I let you go, I want to make sure that you all received the class email I sent uh, a few days ago. Um, if you don't regularly check your school email, uh, you should once in a while come onto Moodle and click class emails to see if I have sent you a new message. Um, so the school has asked us to continue remote learning through the end of the semester. Um, the major impact is on the final projects. Now, uh, if you want to finish your final project and present that, you can still do so. But if your group together decides that you probably won't be able to finish in time, I have prepared a final exam. The final exam will begin after class on week 17 and will end on the day of class on week 18, right before midnight. Uh, you must decide together as a group whether you want to continue with your final project or you would like to take the final exam instead. The exam is an individual exam. Just like the midterm, you cannot talk to anybody. In fact, uh, it's very similar to the midterm exam. The rules are the same. The question is the same. But the scope of the exam is different. Instead of asking about uh, acting and cinematography and editing, this time your answer should try to mention the ideas that we have been talking about in the second half of the semester. So that would be things like visual effects or special effects, the use of technology, the use of desire, the use of symbolism, and the next few weeks uh, themes also realism, irrealism. And I added a new unit because we now have to have class on week 18, so you should also try to mention the use of melodrama. We'll talk about that on week 16. Um, and I have also already chosen the short film that you will watch for the exam. So everything is prepared. Um, all you have to do is each group, please let me know whether you would like to continue your project or uh, individually take the final exam. OK, questions? OK, let's take a 10 minute break and you can start watching the film at 140. Next week we are going to. Uh, should, I just I just closed it. What are we doing next week? Next week, I think we're watching a documentary, right? Yes, next week we're watching a documentary and we will be talking about the idea of realism in film. Yes, OK, thank you. Um, see you next week.